And now let's take a look at hunger. Hunger we're going to see is a much more complex drive. So as opposed to temperature or thirst that are easily sensed and easily regulated, we're going to see with hunger that it's much more complex. Many more signals are involved and there are actually different measures that are taken in the body to in the in different things that are trying to be regulated. So to get into the idea or the topic of hunger, let's take a look at what happens in the basic process of eating. And of course, eating starts with the mouth, right? So um, it's the, the swallowing and the chewing of food. And that involves the taste of food as well. We'll see that the taste of food is an important factor in motivating how much we eat. So the taste buds can detect five primary categories of chemicals. And these are all kind of similar to us probably sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. And if you see here what the type of food is that's related to each, we can see that we come, we're kind of covering, you know, the, the full range, right? So sweets include carbohydrates, sodium, the saltiness, sour is useful for detecting spoiled or rotten food, bitter, is good at detecting toxic chemicals and then umami is sort of that savory flavor associated with protein content and so the signals from the taste buds travel to the insula the insula is a an area of the cortex that is a little bit buried in one of the folds there in the brain and in that area of the brain is also sometimes called the gustatory cortex and gustatory related to the to taste right so it's kind of called the taste cortex um, and it also goes to the nucleus of the solitary tract so these areas are important for receiving those signals about what we're eating so the signals that travel to the insula and to the nucleus of the solitary tract we can see here are consistent so in a given individual if they eat you know these different flavors on monday they'll you'll see activity in these areas of the insula and then if you test them again on say wednesday the same areas of the brain will light up and correspond to these these same tastes so there's consistency so that it looks like there it really is sort of a a sweet a, a set of neurons here in the insula that are involved in detecting sweet flavors and another set that are involved in detecting sour flavors and so on. And we can see here how the insula is sort of located here in this area of the cortex here, in the, the frontal lobe. So let's look a little bit at what other factors are involved in our appetite so there is something called sensory specific satiety so this is not that i'm full because i've eaten enough what it actually refers to is that we get full for a particular type of food but if something else is available then we might have some appetite for that and so just think of like you know if you eat something soft then maybe you get full of that you don't want more of you know th that sort of soft food maybe macaroni and cheese or whatever but then something crunchy might sound good um, or likewise if you're eating something um, a little salty or savory um, you might have enough of that but then if something sweet appears and oh you might be interested in eating that so sensory specific satiety says that we sort of get satiated and think of satiated as sort of satisfied um, you know we've had enough of it we, we get satiated uh, as we eat more and more of one thing but that sense of feeling full is kind of specific to that one item there's also an influence of learned taste aversions that has to do with our motivation to eat and this is now kind of related to if you get sick after eating something either because it was bad or because it was just unfortunate that you got sick after eating something, you tend to not want to eat it again. And so your motivation for eating that food would be really low. So it's, we generally avoid foods that are associated with illness or poor nutrition. And why would this be good, right? 
Kind of makes sense, huh? It doesn't make sense for humans or other animals to want to continue eating something that might be making them sick. So your body and your brain kind of work together on this one. When the body gets sick, the brain has a way of detecting it. There's an area of the brain, the brain called the area postrema. You don't have to memorize that, but there is an area of the brain that receives any toxins that might be in something that we've eaten. And it triggers, you know, sort of like that gag reflex so that we might vomit and get rid of that item that we've eaten that might be bad. But it also then creates this association between the food or the taste of the food that we ate or even the smell of the food so that we don't ever want to have it again. Your book on page 152 describes a series of studies that were done that used learned taste aversion as the basis for um, controlling or minimizing predation by coyotes and other animals. And so sometimes it, there might be conflict between ranchers and some of the wildlife because the wildlife might prey upon some of the sheep or calves. And one way of dealing with this has been to feed, say, a coyote some of that type of meat. So let's say, you know, some sheep but lace the, the food with something that's not dangerous, but that will make the animal sick. And what will do this is a substance called lithium chloride. So it just makes us sick to, your, sick to our stomachs, right? And so it does the same for a coyote, for example. So the coyote eats the tainted sheep meat. It gets sick, it might vomit. And guess what? When it comes across sheep, the next time it will not want to eat it. So this has been used and it's been fairly successful in deterring the predation of, you know, domestic animals like sheep and calves and allowing the predators to basically coexist and not be at risk of being shot because or killed because they've been preying upon these animals. So it's a good solution for that that can be tried. We also have what are called learned taste preferences. These, This is a preference for the flavor of a food that contains a needed nutrient. So kind of interesting when humans and other animals are lacking in a particular, you know, mineral or um, some sort of nutrient in their food. It turns out that something that contains that nutrient is extra appealing it seems extra yummy and we're more motivated to eat it so that kind of suggests that you know there is some truth to you know listen to what your body wants right the problem is that we are surrounded by such an abundance of tasty high calorie foods that our ability to sort of figure out what's best for us and what's needed can get sort of lost in that and so we lose that ability if we are sort of overwhelmed by a bunch of tasty high calorie food so um, that is one negative in that we will not keep such a healthy diet if we are surrounded by too much you know tasty high calorie food we can take a look at now what happens as we eat we're going to see that the process of eating starts off in the mouth, of course. Saliva starts the breakdown of, of starches into glucose in the mouth while we're chewing. It starts getting broken down um, from, you know, starch of the carbo carbohydrates into glucose. In the stomach, hydrochloric acid and pepsin mix with food to digest proteins and break those down into amino acids. And then in the small intestine, the duodenum is where the rest of digestion takes place and fats transformed into fatty acids and glycerol by bile. So basically carbs get broken down into glucose, proteins get broken down into amino acids, and then fats get transformed into fatty acids and glycerol. Um, and then the hepatic portal vein transports products to the liver as well.